I am a pretty bad typist, as you may have seen from the numerous times I've done typing tests during a live stream. My, my words per minute isn't that great, like 50 or 60, like pretty bad. But I would certainly like to improve, and one of the ways you can improve typing is keeping your hands in the optimal position to make sure you can actually hit the keys correctly. And this is easy enough to do when I'm using something like Vim, because I can just have my hands on the keyboard, I don't need to grab my mouse to like move around, to like scroll through the document, anything like that, I can just type and worry about nothing else. But when I'm using something like a word processor, occasionally you do have to grab your mouse. Or maybe not even using the mouse, maybe scrolling through the document by using the arrow keys, maybe deleting something with backspace, or maybe even going to a separate page by using page up and page down. But by having to move your hands away from where they should be located, this is going to slow down your typing. So today we're looking at something that brings all of this functionality into your main typing area without making it harder to generally type. Today we're looking at Touch Cursor Linux, which basically adds a macro layer into your main typing area while you hold down the space key to allow you to actually perform this functionality inside of your main typing area. Now, there is another project called Touch Cursor. Touch Cursor and Touch Cursor Linux aren't actually affiliated, but this is the Linux version of that project. If you have used Touch Cursor over on Windows, all of those bindings from that version are actually going to work over here with the default configuration, but there's also going to be some extra things as well, and we can go and remap everything later down the line if we want to, and I'll show you how to do that a bit later in the video. For now though, let's actually see how the default config works. The first thing you're going to notice is if I go and hold down the space key, it's not actually going to produce a bunch of extra spaces. It's not actually going to produce a space until I actually let go of the key. So if you still do want to use spaces with the space key, that is still going to work exactly the way that you would expect. Now, I'm sure someone's going to ask me to open up screen key while I do this. The problem with doing that though is because it is modifying the keyboard events, uh, if I go and say like do space I to go up, it's actually going to think that I just pressed up rather than pressing those two keys together. On that note, if we go and press space K, that is going to go down. If we press space J, that is going to go left. And space L is going to go right. Now, you might have noticed something about that pattern. So, that is the exact same pattern that your arrow keys are in and that your WASD keys are in as well. So, this is a familiar pattern that you probably used at some point. I know HJKNL is great for the Vim key users, and we can go and modify this a bit later. But most people don't really know the Vim keys like that. For page up and page down, that is going to be space N to do page down, and then space H to do page up. Once again, this isn't a pattern that just makes sense. So space H is page up, and the H key is above the N key, which is page down. Now, one thing I do want to note is these bindings are only going to make sense if you're using a QWERTY keyboard or something that is laid out in a very similar fashion to QWERTY. If you're using something like Dvorak, this is going to be absolute nonsense, and I would highly recommend rebinding all of the keys. For the home key, it's going to be space U, for the end key, it's going to be space O, and then for insert, it's going to be space Y. So if we go back a little bit to, let's say, right here, as we can see, now we have insert enabled. If I start typing, as we can see, acts as it should. Now, delete is going to be space M, and backspace is going to be space P. Now, there's one more binding that exists between touch cursor and touch cursor Linux. So, obviously, we can't just go and, like, hold down the space key to go and produce a bunch of extra spaces. If we go and hold down space B, though, that is going to do how we would expect a space key to actually operate. If you stick with the default bindings and you forget what they ever actually are, there is going to be an image over on the main version of Touch Cursor's website that includes all of those bindings in a neat little graphic. Obviously something like this is going to take quite a while to actually properly get used to, to the point where you can actually efficiently use it. But I think if you're trying to get better at typing, or you're already a good typist and want to somehow improve your typing speed a little bit more, I think working with something like this actually is going to be incredibly useful. So let's move on to how to actually install it because it's not just as simple as downloading the application and then just running it. 
The first problem is actually getting the application installed. Normally stuff like this is going to be in the AUR because I just find random stuff packaged in there that nobody has ever heard of. But for some reason, this has 41 styles on GitHub, doesn't have a package in the AUR. So let's go and install it manually like you're going to have to do it on any other distro anyway. So if we go and download the source code, do it however you like to do so with GitHub CLI, HTTPS, SSH, you know the drill. Basically, download the source code however you feel like it go into the folder, and what we're going to do is run make, and a make install. Why is there an extra space there? Make install, put in your pseudo password, or your account password. It is going to fail for me, because I'm already running the application, but that will get the application actually installed. But trying to run the binary isn't actually going to do anything. The first thing you're going to want to do is actually check out the config directory. So if we go into our config folder, into the touch cursor folder. This is gonna have a file called touchcursor.com. Now, the config exists, which is good. Good first step. But without actually setting this variable right here, it's not actually going to work. So this variable basically says, this is the keyboard to actually modify. Why it doesn't automatically find your keyboard if you only have one keyboard plugged in is absolutely beyond me. But we have to go and manually set it. Luckily for us, though, it actually tells us how to get the name of our keyboard. If we go and take this command right here, basically what this is going to do is output a list of devices that are actually plugged into our computer. So in my case, I'm going to look for the one that says, uh, where would it be? It should be Cherry something or other. So Cherry GMBH Cherry Corded Device. I will take this name and then stick it in the config file. What your keyboard is actually named is going to entirely depend on what keyboard you actually have. If you bought some random keyboard off eBay that is some like unbranded nonsense, it might have some really weird name, but you're going to have to search through this to find the thing that should be your keyboard. I don't actually have anything to help you in that regard. Once you've set the name and saved the file, then we're going to have to go and restart the systemd service used to actually manage the application. Because right now, the application actually is running in the background, but it didn't know what keyboard to actually operate on, so it's just sitting there basically doing nothing. And I didn't mention this earlier, but by default, this is going to use systemd. If you're not using systemd, you're using something like run it or open RC, just go and like rewrite the job into like whatever format you need it to be in, I don't know how you'd go about doing that. I use systemd, so we're going to keep doing it the way that I'm doing it. So if we go and do a system ctl dash dash user restart touch cursor, make sure you spell it correctly, unlike I'm doing, dot service. That is going to go and restart that, and it's going to work perfectly fine. So every time you modify the config file, make sure you go and restart that systemd service to make sure it actually starts using the correct config. Now, when it comes to configuration, it's actually not that difficult to do. Rather than coming up with some weird esoteric format for the key names, instead what it's going to be doing is using the event code names defined inside of the Linux kernel. So if you want to go and set, like, say, I don't know, a mapping to the S key, that is going to be called key S. And let's actually go and do that. So we'll take key S right here. And let's say we want it to be bound to something else. Let's say that when we do key S, we instead want it to do, say, uh, L. Why not? Let's have it print out L every time we press key S. So if we go and restart that now, and we go and hold down space and press the S key, as we can see, now it prints out L. And that's basically it in the way of configuration. Basically, everything is... Left side is going to be the key that you press, and then the right side of the equal sign is going to be the key that it actually produces. The only other thing we can go and configure is the key to actually activate the macro layer. So by default, that is going to be set to key space, but if you want it to be on like, I don't know, the V key for example, you can go and change that to key V, and that is going to do exactly that. Actually, let's do so. So if I go and now... Uh, restart that job or restart that service. If I hold down V and I press, uh, what was it? V and S, that is going to print out an L. Obviously, changing this over to Vimkey movement basically would entail modifying these four lines here to be HJKNL rather than IJKNL instead. 
that's pretty much all you need to do. Now, one thing I was thinking about off camera is you don't actually have to use this for its intended purpose whatsoever. So you could instead go and make this basically a macro layer while you hold down space that has literally nothing to do with actually typing. So there's a bunch of extra keys that are used inside of the Linux kernel that generally don't actually do anything or they just don't print anything out. Things like, say... Uh, where are they? There's some extra F keys in here. So like F13, F14, F15, for example, you don't generally see these on a keyboard and they don't print anything out. So these are effectively free keys to have for like macro bindings. Let's say you want to have a soundboard, for example, and when you hold down space and press... I don't know, the Q, W, E, and R keys, it's going to produce some sort of sound. And that sound is going to be mapped to, say, F13. One thing I would have liked is the option to have more than one macro layer. Obviously, space is very useful, but let's say I have one on the Z, X, and C keys as well. That would give you so many keys to have... That would give you so many keys to have access to, it would give you way too much power. I know there are plenty of other tools out there to do rebindings like this, but I like the idea of having something that just works this seamlessly, has a very simple configuration file that I can just throw together in a couple of minutes. Some of the other tools out there are incredibly powerful, but in the same vein, also have much, much more complex configuration files. Is this something you'd consider using, or just something dumb you'll forget about the second you stop watching this? Let me know in the comment section down below. That's going to be pretty much everything for me. If you like this video and you want to go and support the channel and become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, subscribe, sell Libera pay, all linked in the description down below. This channel is available over on Odyssey. I have a gaming channel called Brody Rops and Plays where I live stream twice a week and upload about five or so YouTube shorts. And I've got a podcast called Tech Over Tea where I talk about nonsense for two hours. That is available over on YouTube and Odyssey for the video version. And the audio version is available anywhere you can find audio podcasts. So that'll be it for me and I'm out.